Let's uh, let's pray. I'll open up a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for your great salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ. God, thank you for demonstrating your love for us and giving your only begotten Son as a propitiation of our sins. We're grateful. All things are possible because of you, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you did for us. We pray that this day. This morning here, all the services, that our hearts will be lifted to you, that we allow you to have your way in us, Father, through your spirit, that we may be lifted up, convicted, and that the joy of our salvation may shine through and be recognized by us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> we are continuing our series on spiritual gifts. And uh, we've gone through, this morning, we've gone through four of them, and I'm leaving the gift of prophecy for last. It's a little extensive, and when I say prophecy, please do not misunderstand me when I say prophecy, because it's not foretelling the future, you know, as we have the Old Testament prophets did. However, the Old Testament prophets did declare the judgment of God, impending judgment of God. They preached against sin and upheld truth. And in Romans chapter 12, which is our reference for this all through the series, verses 3 through 8, we see the seven motivational gifts that are mentioned there. And the first one happens to be prophecy, the last one is mercy. And I'll tell you why I mentioned that, those two in that order in just a few minutes. Um, we've talked about it. I just want to quickly recap because I think it's important. I think repetition helps, you know, drive some things home into our hearts and to our minds sometimes. And so I'm a uh, keen believer of that because I know it's helped me tremendously. Just as memorizing scripture, you know, you memorize it. You memorize it, forget it. Memorize it, forget it. Memorize it, forget it. Memorize it, and you've got it. Typically it takes like three times. But I, uh, we've talked about how Paul addressed the, the Christians in Rome. And by the way, I'm, this is going to be a short uh, lesson, a short time here this morning because I got started so late. My, uh, one of my youngest sons tried, one of my autistic boys tried to escape the house this morning. So I uh, <laughs> kind of threw it. We, anyway, that's a, that's a story in itself. Um, but anyhow, I... Um, you know, Paul talks about the motivational spiritual gifts in chapter 12. Now, be mindful, as I mentioned before, he does not start to address spiritual gifts until chapter 12 because all through chapters 1 through 11, he talks about sin. And it's written to Christians, obviously, in Rome. And so he wants to make sure that they understand the con sin and its consequences and the victory that we have to enter in in Jesus Christ over our sin and it's there for us and it's simply as I said to enter in and accept and apply so in chapter 12 after he addresses all of this and some of our greatest verses that we use for witnessing are through the book of Romans you know you've heard probably of the Romans road you know all and as a matter of fact there's handouts in the back that have the Romans road to salvation if somebody wants to lead somebody to Christ 
some tremendous verses that very clearly explain the gospel and the, and the plan of salvation to Romans. So Paul addresses these Roman Christians and, um, and then finally in chapter 12 after he gets her attention <clears throat> by getting things right before God and that we have an ongoing confessional that daily to be cleansed of our sins, you know, because God wants to use us. He motivates us when we become saved, when we become born into his family, he gives us one of these seven motivational gifts. And he wants us to exercise them through sp our spiritual maturity, which we try to, we get in our own way. And so, and not allowing God to actually fully utilize us and empower us. We quench his spirit through our sin, unconfessed sin that is. So this, this as I mentioned before, has to be a daily confessional. You know, for some of us, especially me, I've mentioned this also before, again, repetition. When I got first got saved, I was a fool. I mean, I was just lost in a very dark place. And I just, Mike, I had to keep track of what I was thinking and doing and saying, like almost moment by moment during the early course of my Christian life. You know, and I had to confess it. And, and so the same thing is expected of us as Christians, you know, all of us. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, and I mentioned before, 1 Corinthians 10.13, there's no temptation taken you, but such, is, but such is is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able to, but will also, with the temptation, provide a way of escape, and you will be able to bear it. God loves us. It's so uh, we just get in our own way. And so, and God wants to use us, you know, but he will not use a dirty vessel, just like you would not use a dirty vessel to eat or drink from. God will not use us. I mean, he will limit our use, you know, in this life. And, but when we exercise our spiritual gift in purity of heart, and we're in, we're in a good, we're in a right relationship with our creator, God will utilize it. He will, the motivational gift that motivates you, he will, uh, he will allow you or give you opportunity to exercise it in some capacity, some ministerial capacity. And I don't mean just in a church setting. But primarily it's used in a church setting because it's primarily for the edification of the saints. And then, not only though, and then you have your motivational gift, the administration of it, you're exercising it, and then God gives the manifestation through his supernatural power of what you're, through your exercising of the motivation of the gift. We see people come to Christ. We see Christians grow spiritually. Their lives change, and that's a blessing. That's out of our control, but that is a manifestation of exercising our spiritual gift in a right relationship with God. So God wants to use us. He's empowered us. Everybody is special, and we're not all the same. Our spiritual gifts actually tend to clash one another, particularly particularly some gifts, and we'll, we'll look at that in just here in a minute. So, and that's why sometimes we'll say, well, why can't they see this? It's plain as day. Well, they're thinking the same thing. Why can't they see this? I, it's just clear. Well, you know, I've mentioned also before, nobody's wrong and everybody's right. So it's important for us to recognize this that we're different. God has given us different motivational gifts. And when we, when we discover that God will put us to use and we'll be able to see each, each other's motivational gifts and get a, a lot of insight and discernment, you know, and some really wise counsel. You know, a pastor that has within him or a leader, a spiritual leader that has, has surrounded himself with people with different spiritual gifts will receive some very wise counsel. Um, I've also mentioned before that, you know, we, our spiritual gifts clash sometimes. And we'll take a look at that also. And we actually looked at that the last time I was here. Last week I was sick. Got over it, thank God. Got to be a little bit nasty there. But we did talk about the last time about how, our, how Christians can irritate us. <laughs> and, and it will happen, you know. Hey, you know, join the human race. Join Christendom, you know. So... You know, it's, uh, it will happen. You know, they see things differently than what we see. 
And we've looked at several spiritual gifts. We're going to look at today two of them, teaching and organizing. And again, it's after, after, from Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. And the word <clears throat> that Paul uses for organizing is leaders. And the same thing in the Greek, it's, it's the same thing. But, and some people have asked me, well, how do you know what your spiritual gift is? And I tell them, probably the most powerful way to understand, there's two ways, really. You start getting active in, in helping people. And see, see how that emphasis on helping others, what it does for you, what joy it brings you. How do you like helping? In what capacity? In what way? In what fashion? And the second way is a powerful way is to understand what your spiritual gift is. It distinct, is to distinguish the gifts, characteristics, and their abuses, actually. Because just like our greatest strengths are our greatest weaknesses, like weaknesses. So our greatest strengths are our greatest weaknesses. And many times we can recognize where our spiritual gift is by what the greatest weaknesses are, how they're misused or abused. So, and that could be a very clear indication of what our spiritual gift is. <clears throat> now, there are, obviously there are positive characteristics of a gift. If we don't develop and use the positive characteristics of the gift, we have, will have the negative characteristics of the gift. And that's our human nature. So, it, it's also amazing to observe that there are certain gifts that are naturally attracted to each other. But they're attracted because the positive expressions of their gifts. But when one of those partners begins to exercise negative aspects, aspects of a gift, the other one gets so frustrated, rejects them. But oftentimes they will go out and find somebody else with the same gift that is exercising the positive aspects. But then the same thing happens after things go on for a while. That's why it's important to know how to help each other to really work on the negative aspects and make them positive. Uh, if you look at your notes, <clears throat> I put together a, uh, this chart here. It gives you uh, the spiritual gifts, the seven spiritual gifts that are listed in Romans 12. And I just want to quickly look at just several combinations of gifts in opposition to each other. And we haven't talked about the prophet. They'll be next week. But the prophet needs the opposite, the mercy. The prophet is listed first, and the mercy is the last one. These two are complement of each other and really need each other. They're so opposed. And like, for example, <clears throat> I gave an illustration, um, an example, weeks ago when I first, the very first day. Picture, of us, picture all of us in a restaurant. All of us in a big restaurant, a long, big table. Everybody's being served. Along come the servers. They've got all the trays of food. They've got their trays of drinks. And the lead server decides to go in a different direction to try to get everybody, get a shortcut, to get everybody served more expeditiously. And in doing so, she trips because it's a narrow area. Food and drink goes flying everywhere. It's on people, it's on the floor, it's on the furniture. So picture you in this scenario. How would you respond to this scene? There would be people that would say, that would get down on their knees, hands and knees, and help in this person. There are people that would be considering how this person feels. There would be another person considering, I wonder if they have to pay for this. Another person would be thinking, you see what happens? You just went the way you should have went. You know, that's the prophet, by the way. You know. If you'd have went the right way, then this never would have happened. <clears throat> you know, and so, you know, everybody's going to react or respond to this, look at this differently. Is anybody wrong in this? No. Everybody's right. We just have a different way of looking at things, what motivates us. So, I, I remember this story. This is a true story. There was this fiery legislator, Irish guy who could not get along with his wife. I mean, they fought constantly. But he eventually learned what his spiritual gift was. He was a prophet. Well, and everybody in the Senate knew that he was, yeah. 
that he had this gift, you know, that's the way he was. It was a problem. But his wife was a mercy, and she was trying to mellow his gift, and he was often rejecting her. After he discovered what his spiritual gift was in his wife, he would often explain, exclaim to all of his colleagues, I found the greatest secret to my life and marriage, quote, unquote, by discovering what my spiritual gift was and discovering what my wife's spiritual gift was. These two gifts really need to understand each other because it's so oppositional. It can be. They just see it from very different, extremely different perspectives. <clears throat> now let's look at the server. The server is one who finds it very difficult to say no to tasks and jobs because then he can only increase his serving because he likes to do that. <clears throat> Therefore, he needs the organizer to coordinate his efforts and to say no for him. Then there's the exhorter. The exhorter has a certain tension with the teacher because the exhorter likes to motivate with illustrations. The teacher does not like and gets nervous around personal illustrations. He doesn't like truth to be identified by experience. He wants truth to come right out of Scripture and not go from experience to Scripture, but from Scripture to experience. So there needs to be a balance there. And this is all from the chart. And of course, we have one left, which is the giver. They keep everything going. They give, you know, and everybody keeps going. Um, let's take a quick look at, <clears throat> from your handout there, the gift of teaching. By the way, um, please check to see if, every, if you have, it should be two, one should be a, Handout should have the gift of teaching. The other one should be the gift of organizing. A person with the motivational gift of teaching is passionate about discovering and validating truth. A teacher is particularly concerned with the accuracy of information, especially church doctrine, and is often gifted with research abilities. Who's the biblical example of this? Luke. Perfect. Luke's work in writing scripture accounts was driven by a desire to verify and preserve the truth about both Jesus' life and the formation of the church so that the faith of believers would be strengthened. Let's look at some general characteristics of somebody with the spiritual gift of teaching. A teacher's basic motivational drive is to discover and validate truth. Teachers are very sensitive to doctrinal integrity. They have great research skills, and they are sincere. Christians who have the gift of teaching search for truth. Teachers study di diligently, sif excuse me, sifting through the scriptures as an archaeologist will carefully sift through artifacts from past civilizations, hoping to find answers to numerous questions. A teacher's passion to discover and validate truth is commendable but he must not become so focused on his mission that he loses balance in the perspective of his role. Teachers help keep the church focused on truth. They are alert to false doctrine and do not honor experience over the authority of scripture. A teacher instinctively questions anything that seems inaccurate and usually that doubt motivates him to search out the answers needed to establish truth. Now, Let's look at a teacher's strengths. A teacher carries out research to gain information and insights. He views Bible study primarily as an academic activity with a spiritual benefit rather than a spiritual activity with that academic benefit. He is passionate about correcting error before it leads to apostasy. A teacher receives special delight in uncovering facts or insights that others have either overlooked or considered insignificant. A teacher places a great deal of emphasis on original language, the original words used and their meanings. Usually, an individual with this motivational gift is not hesitant to challenge statements made or ideas presented by other teachers. This is an example of iron, iron sharpening iron, which is a positive outcome of the teacher's passion for verifying information. And I put here Proverbs reference, Proverbs 27, verses 17. Teachers have excellent study habits, including orderly investigation and the ability to document information in an organized manner. 
they're usually neither sloppy nor slothful when it comes to research. <clears throat> Although the teacher's passion is to prove that facts are either true or false, he usually receives far more satisfaction from his research than he does from presenting what he has discovered in his research. Teachers are known to faithfully study the Word of God because researching truth is a source of great joy for them. Unlike many of the rest of us who must work hard to set aside time to study the Bible, the teacher often has to work hard to quit studying long enough to carry out other necessities of life. For example, many believers with this motivational gift would much rather research a topic than do their laundry, entertain guests, fix their meals, or go shopping for basic needs. A teacher solves problems by studying more. The person with the gift of teaching is diligent, steadfast, and sincere. Now, let's look at a teacher's weaknesses. As we mentioned before, as I mentioned before, our greatest strengths are also our greatest weaknesses. A teacher may be tempted to equate or confuse knowledge with wisdom. Knowledge is information. Wisdom is seeing life from God's perspective. The two are neither equivalent nor worthy of the same esteem. Teachers tend to be exclusive, preferring to limit their interaction and support to individuals or groups who share their doctrinal beliefs. Their concentration on facts rather than people sometimes makes them appear to be cold or insensitive. Teachers can harbor disdain toward instructors who use illustrations to get attention rather than to illustrate truth in a meaningful, memorable manner. They can easily reject unbiblical illustrations, condemning them as irrelevant and distracting. A teacher, more than most of us, can be tempted to be content with having accurate knowledge and be uninterested in taking the next step, application of the knowledge. Because a teacher is able to accumulate knowledge skillfully and apparently with ease, he can easily be tempted to be prideful and have a condescending attitude toward others who do not demonstrate these gifts. A teacher's quest for truth, which motivates him to constantly question what seems to be like everything, often earns him the reputation of being a critical, negative person. Teachers are often impractical, analytical, and unemotional. They tend to not be very interested in social activities and consequently may be regarded as a snobbish or selfish person. Enthusiasm is seldom a strength of a person with this gift. Teachers have a tendency to give you more information than you ask for. They can easily be boring since their hearers are not nearly as interested in the details as they are. And I'm reminded of a, of a true story. This, uh, this mother relayed this story. This is decades ago. She, uh, she told her, her daughter to stop running through the house. Well, the daughter says to her, well, I'm not running, I'm skipping. Well, her mother thought she was being impertinent and scolded her. Well, she wasn't being impertinent. She was, she was a teacher. It was important for, the details were important to her. She wasn't running, she was skipping. You know, and later on, the mother realized that when they have story time in a family, and the mom later admitted that sure enough, that's right, because whenever they get to share their stories, this daughter would give all kinds of details and bore the rest of the family with all of the details. So, you know, and that's how we are. And I also, another true story, I remember this is many years ago, a pastor, I heard the story of a pastor who had an outstanding ministry tell the story of a problem he had growing up. One day his mother was busy. He was a boy, he was a young, he was a boy. So his mom was busy, she looked out the window and saw a neighbor coming to the door. And she had so many things to do, and she told her son to go to the door and tell that neighbor that she was not home. Well, that's bad for any gift. 
But, that, but he had the gift of prophecy. That was the wrong thing to tell him to do. That kind of closed his spirit off to his mother. And it was a very difficult time thereafter. You know, and probably most of us here can remember a time when, when that happened to us. We were asked to do something by somebody in the position of authority over us. Or even a friend or an acquaintance, family member. And it was wrong. It was just, we, you know, and we never forgot that. That actually affected po probably our relationship with that person for quite some time or some time. So if we would only understand the various strengths, the purposes of each motivational spiritual gift, what a difference that would make. You know, and God wants our, the church to be dynamic in this world. And to, that we can be a light. And we individually can be lights into this lost world. That's what God wants us to be. And, and one of the ways we do that is recognizing what our spiritual gift is, a motivational spiritual gift, and utilizing it in the capacity that God has empowered us to do that will give us an opportunity. And we will see all kinds of results from that through, his, through the power of his spirit. I, I will end there because we started late, and we'll pick up with next week with the gift of organization and continue our series. Thank you.